All right, everybody make their way in. Y'all are a chatty bunch today. I like it. I like it. Well, welcome to the second Sunday of the new year. We are here, and 2023 is already turning out to be a wonderful year. So thank you for being here today. We want to say thank you to everyone that's watching us online as well. Uh, there's no better place to be than right here at Living Word Baptist Church, and we're so thankful that you're here. We're going to go ahead and begin this morning. I hope you're ready to worship. Oh, well. Leo, come on. Wow. I don't know what else to do. <laughs> come oh, on, God. Leo. You lead us in a word of prayer, and then, uh, and then we're going to stand to our feet. We're going to sing. God's good. Amen. God is good. Praise the Lord. Good morning, church family. The Bible teaches us that there's no greater name than the name of Jesus. And a lot of the times, we don't experience the greatness because we have not surrendered all areas of our lives. And my prayer today is that, that we, we seek God in, in order to surrender every area of our lives, our dreams, our goals, or marriage, or, or families, everything. We surrender everything to Him, for He is worthy. And not just so because of the blessings, but because God is worthy. Um, and, and, and I encourage, especially those who never entrusted their life to Jesus, if you think your life is really good, wait until you surrender everything to Him, and He will turn everything away, everything around. And I really encourage you to, to give Him a chance. Give Him a chance. And I truly believe that Jesus will transform your life. So let's come before the Lord. Father, thank you for the name of Jesus, for the greatest name, the greatest name, that the name is above all names. And I pray, God, in the name of Jesus for your church today, I pray, Father, help us surrender all. Help us, Father, to, to give everything to you. And, and I pray, Father, give us the desire to seek that. I pray, Father, especially in areas that we want to we wanna have control, areas, God, that we struggle to give to you, or health, or money, or dreams. I pray in the name of Jesus. I pray, help us surrender all to you, for you are worthy, worthy to receive. I, we thank you, Father, for all the victories, and we thank you already for all the dreams, for everything that you already have restored and you have in place for us. I pray for your church, God, I pray that you bless your church, bless with healing, bless God with, with new dreams and the renewal of our dreams, and especially renew of our minds. I pray, give us the strength to seek you and become more like Jesus. We give all the glory to you, and I pray for our prayer, that it be honoring and pleasing to you. Prepare our hearts today, Father, that we surrender to your praise and worship. This is the time to give all the glory, for you are worthy. I pray, Father, that you, your, your word be preached or passed today, for your, for, for your greatness be upon your church. I, I pray, Father, let us be transformed, let us be renewed by the power of your word. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Amen. Stand if you are able this morning, and we are going to get started with I'll Fly Away. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away, fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away when I die. Hallelujah, bye.
this song. Let's go to that last verse and let's do this again. Y'all want to do that? Boy, I love this song. Here we go. Just a few more weary days and then. Hang on. Put your seatbelts on. It's going to be a fun day. It's going to be a good day. What a friend we have in Jesus. Amen? Amen. All our sins and griefs bear. This is a powerful song. Powerful song. And you know what? This song here, I don't know, this morning when we were singing it, I just, all of a sudden I started thinking about all the people in my life that I've been to church with and done things with. And it was just so powerful. That Jesus has brought me into other people's lives and they're into my life. And it was just so amazing. So just think about through your life all the people that God's brought into your life in church. Just because you accepted Jesus Christ. How powerful is that? Here we go.
Stephen was talking about it the other night. There'll be no need for prayer. I mean, mm -hmm. think about that. We'll be there. Amen. That's just going to be conversation at that point. We're there. I love that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a verse we normally sing, but we had to throw that one in. We love it. <laughs>
that <laughs> make so you good. feel like you want to go to heaven, I don't know what will. Right That's going to be, I mean, I'm ready to look to the east. That is the east. That is the east. In fact, all looking that way. <laughs> so good. So that maybe everybody ought to turn around and sing that one. No, I'm just kidding. And y'all can hear me when I'm telling them where we're going to go next, right? Because we really do not plan this. This is God just taking over, and, and they know to keep the seatbelts on. But y'all don't have to. Y'all can just have a good old time. Here we go. Did anybody really, really sing out today? Three of you? Okay, because I was really, really singing out because God is good. 
I mean, we can sing about his goodness and we can praise him for his greatness. And if that doesn't light a fire under you, at the end of the message today, when we have the invitation, you need to come get saved. Seriously. If you're not happy about God, if you're not consumed in his goodness, if you can't sing about his greatness, there's something wrong with your heart. And you need to get saved. You really do. You need to get saved. Because we, we ought to come in here to get... Hang on. Let's do some announcements. Whew. Wow. Okay. All right. Wednesday night. Wednesday night is our, our baked potatoes and salad. I don't even see Tiffany here today. Where's, where's Tiffany at? Is she not here? Oh, well. Um, we're so thankful for our Wednesday nights. That's a great time to come and fellowship with one another and have Bible studies together. So it's just really, really a good, good time. Um, also, save the date because Ivan Parker is coming on February the 11th. Tickets are now for sale, okay? Now, there's free tickets and then there's tickets that you need to purchase. If you want to come and really have a good evening, the tickets are $100 a piece and that includes the meal, that includes the uh, meet and greet with Ivan Parker, it's, there, there's some giveaways, there's, there's a lot of good things for the $100 tickets. And I'm feeling so generous, okay, that if you'll buy two tickets, Frank, if you'll buy two tickets, one for yourself and one for your wife, I'll cut you a deal $150 for two, all right? 300 for four, but if you buy two, it's 150, all right? So make sure you go ahead and get those. We're only selling 50 tickets, okay? That's all that we can really allow in our uh, fellowship hall. So we're only going to sell 50 of those tickets, includes the meal giveaways, stuff like that. And then we're going to give an opportunity for our members to buy those tickets first, and then we're going to open it up to the public. And then there's general admission tickets. They're free. Uh, just come at 6.30, enjoy the concert. You're not going to have the choice of seats. It's just going to be uh, wherever, wherever there's a seat available, okay? Um, we're reaching out to different churches this year and inviting them to come. Uh, we don't have to worry about COVID this year, so we, we expect the place to be really packed out, okay? Tim's group is inviting all their people as well, so if you were here for the Source of Strength concert, you know how busy it's going to be in here that night, so... Uh, get pre prepared for that. All right, well, let's go ahead and dismiss our children up to fourth grade. I didn't even check to see who's serving. Amy's back there. Thank you, Amy. All right. All right. So thankful for Emily and Paul. And let's continue to pray for Emily and Paul. If y'all don't know, uh, they have been misplaced out of their home. It flooded right before Christmas, um, and they have been living uh, with his parents over in Allen. So they have been traveling. Uh, far away for church and of course they've been out of town a few times so we need to really be in prayer for Paul and Emily as their house is being remodeled uh, just not a you know they probably wanted to remodel their house but you know just not the right timing at Christmas but uh, we're, we're so thankful and thank you to the many of you that are helping them uh, let out the dogs I see the schedule uh, some we're going over morning and evening uh, thank you so much for your dedication to help this family out during this time. We're so thankful for them. And you see it on the screen. I'm not going to say anything. You see it on the screen, okay? I will say this. If your phone rings today, I will call you out, <laughs> okay? Because <laughs> you've been warned. You, you've been warned. Uh, that seriously, it's very disrespectful um, to take a phone call in the middle of a worship service. So just go ahead and get your phone out, put it on vibrate so it don't happen. I don't want to have to single nobody out, but it is very, very distracting. Um, so last week, um, I gave you two challenges. The first challenge was to find a word in the word. And I have been so impressed by so many of you who have been texting me, calling me, uh, even Wednesday night, saying what your word is. And it's thrilling my soul that you are getting into the word and you're finding that one specific word that is so meaningful to you that you're going to adopt it, adapt it into your life and have it so meaningful, okay? So if you, if you have not, y'all see why it's so distracting? If you have not getting that word yet, I want you to pray. Get that word, get that word uh, into your life. The second challenge I gave you was I challenge you to read the New Testament 
in 24 days, okay? You can go to our website, and on the home page, you can see that there's a link to get that sheet that has the 24-day schedule. You can just check it off. Read Matthew in two days, Mark in two days, Luke in two days, on down through. The little uh, books, you can read through about three of them in one day. So it's a challenge that I'm setting before you as a church. You're going to grow more spiritual, deeper in your relationship with God. And then third, the third challenge I gave you last week was make sure when you come in here today that you're prayed up. Because if you're prayed up, you're going to receive the blessing that God has in store for you. I want to share with you a powerful passage of Scripture today in Matthew chapter 20. And if you're prayed up and you're ready to receive a good word from the Lord, not from me, but from the Lord. I'm telling you, you're going to leave here with your socks blessed off. I mean, you're going to walk out of here barefooted today, just blessed, okay? And that's, and, and I, I put some emphasis on this last week, all three of you that were here. I know it was New Year's Eve the night before, but we had a good time. And, um, hey, I'm, I'm so glad to see you here today. I'm so glad uh, that you've made your way back to church and... Uh, I tell you, I woke up at 4 o'clock this morning, revived, ready to go. I couldn't wait to get my kids up out of the bed, my wife up out of the bed, and say, let's get to church. And I was still late getting here this morning. And uh, I'm, I'm just excited. I'm really excited about this new year. I'm excited about what God has been speaking to me about. And I'm just excited to start sharing some of these things uh, next week, we, we are having a big meeting with eight men who the elders have chosen to be the next deacons of our church. And so next Sunday, the 15th, uh, we're going to have a meeting right after the worship service. Uh, I hope those eight men are prepared to stay, and we're going to meet. And then in February, we're going to have a deacon ordination service. So it's going to be a good thing. These deacons are going to be taking over some ministry roles in our church. So it's going to take our church to the next level. It's really going to be structuring some leadership, some godly, uh, God-fearing men that, are, that their hearts are set on God. And that's what we need in this church. Men, people who love the Lord. Amen? All right. Buckle your seatbelts this morning. Because this passage of scripture that I want to share with you, I can't start in Matthew chapter 20. Because what I have to do is I have to give you a context, and I have to give you some background so that we can fully understand what's taking place. So I think what is the best thing to do right now is let's turn to the Lord in prayer, and let's ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us through His Word today. Father, we come to you at this moment, at this time of this service, and Lord, we want to surrender ourselves to you. In these next few minutes, Father, I pray that there be no distractions, that our minds will be so set on your word and hearing from you, Lord, that nothing else matters. I'm not even concerned about what we're going to eat for lunch or what's happening at work tomorrow or what's happening at school or, or whatever's happening, Lord. We, we are so ready for you to speak to our hearts today. And Lord, I pray that our hearts be transformed to the renewing of your spirit. How it renews us, it revives us, it gives us what we need. So today we need that, Father. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the devil's back in the attic. As you can see, I got a little strobe light on me this, this morning. I think we just need to sing Waymaker. That's what we did last week. We sang Waymaker, and it started working correctly. So if there's any electricians that know anything about wiring and how to fix a flickering light, let us know, really, because it's bothering. It's really bothersome. But anyways, uh, we're going to get that fixed. Even if uh, I got a baseball bat somewhere around here, we'll, we'll get it fixed. How's that? All right. All um, right. So let, 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 me, let me give you some background. Let me give you some background, some context of what's taking place. Jesus is nearing the end of his earthly ministry. He's had some followers called the disciples who have left their businesses. They've left everything. They've even abandoned their own family 
to come and to serve Jesus, to follow Jesus, and to learn from Jesus. And starting in chapter 18, a very disturbing verse appears. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 18, At that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who's the greatest? And see, there, there's this heart and this attitude in the disciples of, okay, well now when Jesus leaves, who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to be the leader? And so Jesus begins this teaching about salvation, about eternal life. And it really avoids the topic that, that really caught my attention in, in chapter 18, verse 1. But then you come over to chapter 19, and you see that he comes back to address some things, and he has this conversation with uh, what we call the rich young ruler. And he came to Jesus, and he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, of course, Jesus said, you know, some, keep the Ten Commandments, basically. And the young man says, well, I've done all these things from my youth up. And then Jesus says, well, you're still missing something. You go sell everything that you have give it to the poor, and then come back and follow me. You see, he was missing something deep down in his heart. He wanted to be great. But to the world's standard, he wanted to be great. Not in the kingdom of heaven, but on the kingdom of this earth. So what Jesus did, he says, okay, well, I want to show you what you're missing. You're missing the poor spirit. And folks, I, I want to say this before we go any further right here. We all should come before the throne of God with a humble, poor spirit. Because if you come in with any type of pride, if you come in with any type of haughtiness, you're taking the place of God. And there's no, there's no place for you and God on the throne. That's a one-seat throne. And we know who sits on that throne. So let's give Him all that he deserves, right? Let's give him the worthy of his praise. He's worthy of it. So then, um, the disciples, they asked Jesus this question in, in verse 25 of chapter 19. Um, who then can be saved? Because Jesus just said the comment, it's, greater for, it's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter into heaven. Because there are so many things that happen in the heart of a man that is so consumed in material things, in riches of this earth, that it will actually keep them from inheriting eternal life. Because they've set up their own kingdom right here, right now. And so the disciples ask this question, who then can be saved? And then he says, with men it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. And the disciples began to worry in their hearts they said man we, we've given up everything we've given up everything to follow you and so jesus knowing their heart and knowing what has taken place deep down in them he gives this parable that we're going to read right here in matthew chapter 20 it's a parable okay what's a parable it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning but if you really want to get the full understanding, we have to jump ahead. Actually, you, you can go to the last verse of chapter 19. He says, but many who are first will be last in the last first. If you go to chapter 20, uh, verse 16, so the last will be first and the first last. So tucked in between those two phrases is this parable. And this parable is so important even for us today. So with that context, you need to understand this as well. Matthew is the one who's recording this. Matthew was a tax collector. Matthew was one of these that gave up everything to follow Jesus. And it wasn't until the very end that Matthew, it really sunk in with him, I know who Jesus is. I know the one who has redeemed me. I know the one that I am following is worth it all. But it wasn't until after this teaching, okay? So Matthew chapter 20, we're going to pick up, and I'm just going to preach my way through uh, Matthew chapter 20, starting in verse 1. 
Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Automatically, Jesus is saying, Okay, here is an example. Here is an earthly story. I want you to get the meaning of this because there is a special purpose for what I'm saying. You haven't listened in the past, so now I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you something that you'll get. You'll understand. Okay, so what Jesus was doing was trying to get down on the level where the disciples were so that they could understand. I don't know if you know me, but I'm a simple man. I really like to keep things simple. And that's how I preach. I want to keep it simple. I want to keep it to where we can understand it. And so this message today is really, really simple. But the understanding of it is really, really deep. And so that's why I want you to be really prayed up as we walk through this passage of Scripture. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner, a landowner who owned a vineyard, okay? Now, real quickly, I want you to notice that a vineyard is a place where a lot of grapevines are growing. Some of you that are come from California, you probably see all the vineyards up on the hillsides, uh, harvesting the grapes and it requires a lot of workers it requires a lot of laborers to come and harvest the grapes well at this time it is harvest season so the landowner goes out and he looks for people who will come to work in his garden or in his vineyard so now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day he sent them into his vineyard. So what this landowner did, he went up to the local Home Depot or the Lowe's right here in Little Elm. He sat in the parking lot and he wanted to see if there's anybody that was willing to come and work. And so there were some people hanging out. This was custom that they needed work for the day. And so he saw them and he says, hey, you come work for me. And they said, well, how much are you going to pay us? And Jesus, telling this story, says that the landowner said, I will pay you a denarius. And they were like, really? You're going to pay us a denarius to come work for you? You see, what is a denarius? A denarius is a Roman coin. A Roman coin that if we were to put some value on it today, it would be a high um, laborious day, okay? High amount, dollar amount for labor. Okay, so let's just say today it would be $300, okay? So the landowner says, I'm going to give you this coin, and if you'll come work for me from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., I will give you this denarius, and it's worth $300, okay? A lot of people would say, sign me up. I'm ready to go. That's not the wages of a laborer, by the way. So when this landowner offered a denarius, they agreed to accept it. They're like, wow, this is really good. I can go work. Hey, these people set out that day. Most laborers are, are, are kind of like what we see on the, home, on the homeless streets today. They go out and they hold their signs hoping that someone will give them something. Here, this landowner goes out and he sees these people that are willing to work and he finds them and they want to work. And so he hires them. They agreed to the set amount, a denarius, for the day. And then he said, let's go to work. We got a lot of work to do, okay? As he went out, about the third hour, he went back to the marketplace and saw some others standing idle. In other words, at, um, say, around 9 o'clock, the third hour, this landowner goes back into the parking lot or to the marketplace and he sees some workers, some laborers, who are just standing around. They don't have anybody to give them any work. So this landowner says, hey, why don't you come work for me? Why don't you just come on? Okay. Now you've got to get in your mind, these people are there looking for work. Work day begins at 6 a.m. And here it is, 9 o'clock, three hours are wasted but this landowner says, I need more help, so come on. In verse 4 it says, And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. They didn't agree to a certain amount, did they? He says, I will do what is right for you. 
Verse 5. Again, he went about the sixth hour at noon. This landowner goes back out. And then again at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he goes back to the marketplace and he gets these workers to come back and work for him. And he says, I will do what is right. Okay? Then verse 6. And about the 11th hour, this is about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, one hour before quitting time, he went out and he found some others who were just standing around who have still not found work. But he asked them this question. Why have you been standing here idle all day? And they responded and they said to him, Because no one hired us. No one gave us an opportunity. No one would give us the opportunity to go and work and make any money. We have been standing here all day. Now listen to me. These are men who have families. These are people who need to support their families and they're willing to work. They, they are still in the parking lot at 5 o'clock in the afternoon hoping that there will be somebody that will come along and say, hey, why don't you come help me for a little while? Because they're saying, hey, at least a little bit of money is good enough. At least I can go home and I, and I can have a little bit of integrity when I go home and say, you know what, it wasn't a wasted day. At least I brought home something today. But he told them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, all right, this is the end of the workday, it's 6 o'clock, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward or to the manager or to the foreman, call all the laborers and give them their wages, but I want you to begin with the last first. I want you to begin with those who came at 5 o'clock. I want you to begin with those that came at 3 o'clock, and I want you to give them their wages. And when those came who were hired about the 11th hour, about 5 o'clock, they each received about $300. Wow. I mean, he, here, the, the one that only worked an hour. Now, l l let me ask you something. The, the, how many bosses do we have in the room? Any managers? Any managers in the room? Uh, how many's ever hired somebody before to do some land work or yard work? I, I think we've all kind of you know, set an agreement to somebody, hey, if you'll just come dig this, or if you'll come do this, or you'll do this, I'll, I'll give you some money. Okay, j just imagine they show up, there's one hour left of work. Okay, and there's some serious hard work to get done. And, and they show up, okay, and, and who do they see? They see a crowd that has been there since 6 o'clock in the morning who are sweaty, who are stinky, who are dirty, because they've been working all day. And here this 5 o'clock crowd shows up. And these are the type of people, by the way, that want to tell the 6 o'clock a.m. people how to do the job. Right? They start saying, man, what? You should have just waited till 5 o'clock and you don't even have to do anything. We just have meetings at 5 o'clock. You know, we're winding the day down. So here, the 5 o'clock crowd gets paid first. They get... A $300 coin, I'm just saying $300, they get a denarius, and, and they're impressed. That 5 o'clock crowd was like, wow, I get to go home now and, and tell my wife, tell my children, look what the Lord has done for us today. I didn't even have to work but an hour, and he's blessed us. You think about the 12 o'clock crowd, the 3 o'clock crowd, the 9 o'clock, they didn't have to work 12 hours. They all received this denarius, they received this denarius. But watch this. This is, this is the meat of the message right here. But when the first, the six o'clock crowd, when they came to collect their wages, they supposed that they would receive more. Remember, they made an agreement for how much? A denarius. And they likewise received each a denarius. Now, is that fair? Is it? Is it fair? I mean, you got, you've got a set of men who have worked in the heat for 12 hours for $300, and you got a group over here that showed up for one hour and they received $300. Is it fair? I mean, in our minds, we're thinking, no, it's not fair, Pastor. I mean, that's, that's some common sense there. It's not fair. 
Uh, let's break it down by the hourly wage, right? 300 divided by 12. Not good at math, but, it, you know, there's a set amount. But, hey, you make $300 an hour? Sign me up all day, right? I, that's some good wages. Now, watch this, verse 11. And when they had received it, they complained to the landowner. I think it's a good time to stop right here and do some interpretation. The landowner in this story is God. You see, there's a six o'clock crowd who have made an agreement with God. I'll accept the free gift of salvation. I'll be a follower of you. And I want eternal life. And Jesus says, I'm going to give that to you. Right? Okay? Now, let's keep going. They complained against the landowner. How many ever complained to God? God, this isn't fair. God, here I am. I go to church. Now, I'm just telling you what I've said in my life. In my in my thoughts and in my heart and my complaining to God. God, I've been to church. I've given my tithes. I've served on committees. I helped somebody with a flat tire on the side of the road. And you still want me to get sick? I mean, I still have these bills that are coming in from the last time that we had to go to the hospital. And now I've got more bills coming in. And I look over there. Now, there may be some people on your pew the same way. You look over and you see somebody that really hadn't even been through any struggles in their life. You see some people that, man, life has just always been good. And I met a lady one time. She, she told me this. I've never had a struggle in my life. And I thought to myself, I wish I was you. I wish that I'd never had a struggle in my life. And she honestly said that. But there are some people that we look at and we're like, man. I mean, they have not had to endure the hardships that I've had to endure. I mean, they're driving fancy cars, Porsches, Lamborghinis. They don't even go to church on Sunday. They don't tithe. I mean, they're, they're, not, they're, they're not serving on no committee. They're not showing up to no food distribution on a Saturday morning when it's snowing. But yet they get to live that luxurious lifestyle. I mean, they make $300 an hour. They make $300 a minute probably. They get on their little keyboard and sell a little stock or buy a little this, sell it there, and then boop, 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 money just rolling in, right? And we look over and like, man, every time I get in my car, it's like, <laughs> thank you, Lord. Anybody? Anybody ever had a car like that? I mean, I'm, I'm driving a car. Y'all think, oh, Pastor's driving a Cadillac. Hey, that Cadillac has 243,000 miles on it. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I've, I've, I've got, I don't have none of those people calling me for extended warranty. They avoid me. They don't call me. Y'all notice my phone don't ring like y'all's. I don't get those phone calls. They're like, uh, you, you just go fix your own problems, right? So I, I cranked it up this morning, and I was like, another day, thank you, Lord. You know, a, th those are good things for me, okay? Now, some people, they're like, man, I've got a 15-year warranty on this vehicle. I don't have to worry about it. Well, good for you, all right? But for us, all right, we, 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 we have some of these concerns. We have some of these burdens that we're carrying around, and it's natural. Listen, it's natural for me to look at someone else and be like, man, I wish I had a nice car. Man, I wish I had a nice job. Man, I wish that I could just go home at night and don't have to worry about no church members texting or calling or bothering me. Right? Have we not ever considered some of those things? Like, man, they got it good. But I want you to, I want you to remember this, and we're going to get to it, back to it here in just a minute. You never know what somebody else is going through. Okay? Now, they complained against the landowner. And there are some six o'clock crowd people sitting in our pews, sitting in these rows, 
and probably sitting even in the seat you're sitting in that are complaining to God about some things that have gone on in the past. Or maybe they're happening right now. There's a six o'clock crowd that says, I've done my time. I have done all that has been asked of me. Why do I have to keep suffering? Why do I have to keep, as these laborers would say, why did I have to work 12 hours in the field? Why did I have to keep going? Why did I have to do all this? And they look at God and they say, it's not fair. It's not fair. And that's one of the biggest mistakes that we can make as a Christian. And I've got some points and we'll just, we'll just fly through them here in just a minute. In this story, we see three mistakes that are made. And we're going to see them here in just a second. These last men have worked only one hour. This is their complaint to the landowner. These last men have only worked for an hour, and you made them equal to us and have borne the burden, and we have borne the, burden, the bur borne the burden of the heat of the day. In other words, we have broken our back for you, and now you want to go pay them the same amount that you're paying us? It doesn't make sense. And they're upset. But he answered one of them. He could only handle one of them. I think only one It was just good enough. And he said, friend, well, let's stop right there. This was not a friend. He just found these guys that morning, right? So this is one of those good ways of saying, listen here, pal. Right? It's, it's one of those good, nasty comments. Look, I'm going to call you friend because what I really want to call you is not correct. It's, it's not godly. So I'm going to keep my cool and I'm just going to call you friend, right? It, it, it'd be one of these things, okay, pal, fella, listen here. And this is what he says. I am doing you no wrong. All right, you, you, you got to understand the frustration. The disciples, they, they, they understand the frustration. They're getting what Jesus is trying to say. I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Listen here. What this landowner says to the six o'clock crowd, did we not agree on a set amount? And of course in their minds they're saying, yes, we did agree. Was it not a good amount? Oh yes, yes, it, it was a good amount. $300 for the day. That was a lot more, probably double than what they would normally get paid for that day's labor. But now that they see someone else getting more, they start to complain, but who do they complain against? The landowner. They want to complain against the landowner and say, you're not being fair. Because this, this is what's happening. When, when this landowner told the servant or the steward, the, the foreman, go and make sure that those who came last get paid first, because I want that first crowd to really see what's taking place. All right? They need to witness the goodness and the greatness of the landowner. Okay? Now this landowner has already been good to the six o'clock crowd, right? And let, let, let's just go ahead and make some common sense here. We've all inherited eternal life. Amen? If you have been saved and born again through the blood of Jesus Christ, you have everything that you need. You have eternal life. You have eternal security. You have victory over every problem, over every trouble. What more do you want than eternal life? It is good. It is great. And we don't deserve it. But God gave it to us. He said, here you go. Here's my son. He'll die for your sins. He'll give you what you need. And we're like, yes, yes. Only when we came in a poor spirit. But when we come into a prideful spirit, we say, how, how come there's some families in our church that get to go to Greece, get to go to London, spend Christmas in New York? I'm kidding over here. It really happened. By the way, you're like, have you ever spent Christmas in the airport? <laughs> it's, it's tough, right? So uh, listen, it's, it's natural for us to look at how God is blessing others and say, I, I didn't get those blessings. God, God, you didn't bless me like that. 
God, you didn't give me some of that. I want some of that. And God's looking back saying, was I not fair to you? Did I not give you eternal life? And now you want more? Because you see somebody else has something that you don't have? Is it making sense now? I think it's coming to a point that we all in our hearts were saying, we're the six o'clock crowd. We're the six o'clock crowd that says, God, I have done everything for you. We're going to rename that six o'clock crowd to the Baptist group. Because the Baptists are the ones that complain. You know what the Baptists complain more about? When there's no food. <laughs> hey, we can have eternal life all day, but hey, if that casserole runs out, we got problems. We got problems. And I've seen some of y'all. Y'all watch my eyes when we have these fellowship meals. And when my eyes on that banana pudding, and I see there's only about two helpings left, I'm getting serious. If somebody gets up, I'm running. Because I know what they're going after. They're going after that banana pudding. All right? So when we start having this heart issue, all right, we all think about we're that 6 o'clock crowd. But you, you want to be honest with yourself? You really want to be honest with God? We're really that 5 o'clock crowd. Did we deserve anything? Did we make a deal with God? Did we, did, did we really make a deal with God to say, God, all right, I will be a preacher as long as I can go to Living Word Baptist Church. That, that, that wasn't in my deal making. It wasn't in my deal making. You know, you know what my only request was to God? When I was 16, being called, and I said, no, I don't want to be like those other preachers. I don't want to be boring. I don't want to waste my life like the rest of them. When I was about 21, 22, 23, I said, okay, Lord, you got my attention now. But I don't want to be a boring preacher. Man, you send me wherever you want to send me. But I don't want to preach those boring Baptist messages. And praise the Lord. He opened the door for me to come to Little Elm, Texas, where there ain't nobody wanting a boring message. I haven't heard the first request. Pastor, I just want one of them boring messages. Haven't heard it. And if I ever see it come across, I'm just going to hit delete real quick so I, I didn't get it. I, I don't know. I didn't get your message. Nobody wants a boring message, right? But I said, Lord, I want you to light a fire into me. I want you to light a fire into me so that it will be so contagious that somebody else gets on fire for you. Because I have, I have witnessed the goodness of God. I have witnessed the greatness of God in my life. And I want to share with people how good God is. I want, to, I want to motivate people that you don't just go out on a Saturday morning to a food distribution. By the way, the Saturdays are food distribution. You don't go out there on the early morning just because you have to. You go out there because you want to. You want to serve the Lord because He's been good to you. You want to show up to church because He's been good to you. We've got some members I haven't seen in three years. Three years! And they call themselves a member of this church. Where are you? Come to church. Come show up. Bring your checkbook, by the way. So when we think about what do we deserve from God? Judgment. That's what we deserve. We deserve the judgment of God. In other words, we deserve to go to hell because we sinned. But the goodness and the greatness of God says, I don't want you to perish. I don't want you to die. I want you to come and be in my presence. I want you to come and be with me. And I'm going to provide a way for you to come. And folks, it wasn't for no denarius. We are that five o'clock crowd that says, man, I'm just so thankful that your grace is so sufficient that you showed up at the last minute and you gave me a chance. Because that's that five o'clock crowd that says, we've been sitting here all day. Nobody else wanted us. Nobody else wanted to have anything to do with us. And that landowner says, why are you still here? You could have left. You could have gone home. And he says, no, we had hope. We had hope. We saw what you did to those other people. We saw what you did to that 6 o'clock crowd and gave them a lot more than what they're worth. We saw what you did to that 9 o'clock crowd and that 12 o'clock crowd. And we saw what you did at 3 o'clock. And we were just hoping and praying you would show up. And you did. Aren't you glad when Jesus showed up? I know we just celebrated Christmas. 
But man, I'm so glad that Jesus showed up. And boy, I get tickled in my spirit when I wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning and I say, Lord, I can't wait for you to show up today. I can't wait for you to show up because, man, I'm hungry for your presence. I'm hungry to see what you have in store for us. I can't wait to get there to sing. I can't wait to get there and open up your word. I can't wait. I can't wait. That's not the attitude of the 6 o'clock crowd, is it? We show up sometimes and say, Give it to us. We deserve it. We made an agreement. Boy, isn't that a bad spirit. Man, I want a church full of that 5 o'clock crowd. Man, that they look at everything in their life as a blessing. They look at everything that comes into their life. Man, I didn't deserve it, but God, you're so good you gave it to me. Man, God, you have been so good. I don't deserve anything. I, I, I deserve to be sick. I deserve to be poor. I deserve to live on the streets. But you've given me a roof over my head. You've given me nice, clean clothes. You've given a wife to me that loves me, to help her. You've given me children that are just a blessing. And I want to praise you for it. I want to praise your name. And I can't wait till we go to church. And I can praise your name. Praise your name. I can't wait to give God the blessings for healing me. Isn't that right, Jeff Dalton? That's what you told me on Wednesday night. Man, God's been so good to me. He healed me. He brought me out of two strokes. Brought me to, to where I am right now. Boy, you should have seen old Jeff Dalton Wednesday night. He'd do a little dance. And I thought, man, that's what everybody needs to be feeling. That's what ever, now everybody needs to be experiencing. Brought you out of a heart attack. Thought you were dead, right? See, some of you, some of you never experienced some of those things before. You've never walked the walk that some other people's walked. We call that with a silver spoon, don't we? You just have a little silver spoon. Somebody feeding you, living like a king. You know what Jesus says about that? It's harder for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than somebody like that to get into heaven. Because what God wants is everybody to come with a humble spirit and everybody to be humbled in their spirit to say, there ain't nothing more than I need right now than the grace of God. I need His mercy. I need His forgiveness. Man, I need it. I need it. I need it. And that's where our attitude needs to be today. We need to be that 5 o'clock crowd that says, man, I was just hoping you would give me a blessing. I was just hoping that something good would come along. And it did. And I'm going to praise you for it. Man, don't you know that 5 o'clock crowd? They weren't boasting. They were praising. They weren't boasting about, man, look at us. We only had to work one hour. They were like, man, you, seriously? You're going to give me $300 for only working about 30 minutes? Because by the time we got here, told everybody else how to do their job, and then it was time to wind it back down. We only worked for like 30 minutes and got $300. The six o'clock crowd turns to this landowner and says, it's not fair. It's not fair. That's one of the biggest mistakes that we can ever make with God is we tell God, God, it's not fair. What you have done is not fair. Folks, if you've ever said that, you need to pray for forgiveness because I already have because God is fair. God is more than fair because if he was fair, right, if he was a fair judge, Right? He would ask, did you speed? Then you get a ticket. You pay the ticket. Did you pay the ticket? No. Okay, you go to jail. Well, unless you live in Las Vegas. Y'all hear that? You don't, you don't go to jail if you don't pay your tickets in Las Vegas now. They're changing the laws. So when, when you, th I know, isn't that crazy? There used to be a crime that you had to pay if you didn't, you know. Anyways. So here... The six o'clock crowd, man, they're upset. They're, they're, they're really having a hard time. Let's, let's get through this. Take, uh, th this landowner is so upset. This is what he says. Take what is yours. Because we made an agreement. Take what is yours and go on your way. What we would say at Alabama is go and get. Go on and get. Y'all say that. Go on and get. Y'all could live in Alabama. Go on and get. All right? That, 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 that is nice for... I don't want you standing in my face right now. I have done what is right. I have done what is more than fair. 
I have done what is good. Take what is yours and get out. I mean, this landowner is really, really upset. You think God ever gets upset? Absolutely. This is why Jesus is telling this story. Let's bring in the context now. What's going on? The disciples sitting back says, who's the greatest? Jesus wants to look over at those disciples. Are, are, you, are you for real? You really want to have this conversation? God's given you eternal life, and you want to know who's the greatest? You, you, you think you deserve more when you get to heaven? I mean, is there anybody in the room who thinks they deserve more when they get to heaven? I hope not. Don't raise your hand. Because I, I, I promise you, when I enter in those, gate, those pearly gates of heaven and I see Peter standing there, I'm going to hug his neck. I'm going to find Jesus just as fast as I can, and I'm just going to go ahead and start worshiping for the next 10 billion years. And that'll be about three days worth, and then I'll find some other people. I ain't worried about nobody else at this point. All, all, all I want to do is just thank Jesus. Because well, that's what the Bible says we're going to be doing. I mean, when, when we come to church, that's just a warm-up. It's, it's really just a warm-up for what's coming. If Jesus were to come back this afternoon, did, did you get warmed up today? Did you get warmed up for your worship? And, and I always say this, if, if, if you don't like worshiping now, you're not going to like heaven. You, you just not, you, you're just not going to like it. Because it's going to be loud. And, and man, we were up here praying today, and I was thinking, I wonder if I'm going to be able to play the bass in heaven. I, I wonder if God's ever going to look over there. Come here, Stephen. You're up. Hit the base. Hit the base. And, I, I'm, I'm, man, I, and I'm going to be like, because at that point we're all knowing, right? I'm going to man, I'm going to be playing that bass like, I watch Kevin Hamlin play that bass sometimes, and I'm like, man, I wish, just wish, just wish I could play the bass. Just wish, you right? I mean, man, I'm just happy to be doing what I'm doing. I just enjoy it. Really, I, I'm, I'm just back here just enjoying myself. I, I, I don't know that I enjoy myself sitting in a pew. I don't know if I could be like y'all sometimes. I like to be up here and into it, right? Y'all forgive me because I'm, I'm really excited today. I'm, I'm really excited about the future of this year. I'm excited about what God is doing. But listen, we have to consider ourselves already blessed. If God doesn't do another thing for 2023 in our life or in the life of the church, we have everything that we need. And we should have that heart of saying, Lord, it, it, it really doesn't matter. But anything extra, man, we're going to do backflips over it. I mean, we're going to be so excited that God had so much, so much love for us as a church, so much love for us as a families, as individuals, that he says, man, I, 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 we just want to just praise you. We might even start having Saturday night worship. We, we might start having Friday night worship because God's been so good. There's been some times that, man, I just wanted to show up. Last Tuesday night, we had church right here. There wasn't very many people out there, but we had church up here. It was a good time because we were singing about the goodness of God. And we couldn't hold back. We, we were doing it this morning. I was like, man, it's so good. It is so good. Because God's mercies never fail us. God's goodness never runs out. He is a good God. He is a merciful God. He is a gracious God. Amen? Man, it's good. Verse 15. This is what the landowner says. Is it against the law for me to do whatever I wish to do with my money? Isn't that a good response? Here are those land, the, the laborers. They're complaining. They'd already gone out and formed a union. Already sent the emails to the to the HR department. You know, they're already doing an investigation. They, you know, didn't treat the employees fairly. Right? Some of y'all deal with that garbage. We want what is fair. They're out there holding picket signs. You know, they're not working. Holding picket signs. We want what is fair. Well, <clears throat> is it against the law for me to. <laughs> Or is your eye, what, or is your eye evil because I'm good? You know what that means. Is your eye evil? And, and, he, and he's talking to the six o'clock crowd. Did, did, did you just happen to see other people bless more than you, and you said, "Man, I'm jealous"? That's what that means. And that's us sometimes. That's why I'm saying we need to be that five o'clock crowd because we for sure ain't looking at nobody else. 
We're looking at ourselves saying, thank you, God. Thank you for what you've done for me. So if we start looking around at other people, you know why this landowner's upset? Number one, he's upset. Three complaints. Number one, God's upset sometimes because we say he's not good. How dare us to say God's not good? You say, well, I've never said that. You ever complained? Well, you didn't say the words. Didn't say the words, but, nah. You know, if you really get to the Greek text of what's going on here, they grumbled under the voice. God hears everything you say. God hears everything you think. You can't hide anything from God. He knows what you're thinking in your heart. He knows what's happening. He knows what's taking place. Don't ever say God's not good. What do we say? God is good. <laughs> All the time. God is good. God is good, isn't he? Man, I can could, I, I could just preach God is good all day. Because he is good. Don't ever say God's not fair. Because he is fair. He's more than fair. I mean, he's given me new breath today. I woke up at 4 o'clock and I said, man, I don't need to be up right now. I need to go back to sleep. I just sat there in my bed. Just, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Waiting for that five o'clock alarm to go up. Whoa, let's go. Let's go. First thing I did was make some coffee. Didn't need it, but it's just a routine that I do on Sunday morning. Made some coffee, got to praying, got to studying, got to that. Whoa, man, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. About seven o'clock, I'm getting a little personal. About seven o'clock, I go wake up the family. Man, I give them two hours extra. I go wake up the family. We well, got to go, got to go, got to go. And they're like, are you kidding me? Really? Right? Man, I'm letting the dogs out. I'm out there throwing balls with the dogs. I'm having a good time. Because I know today's going to be a good day. Man, I, I'm already feeling it, right? And, and, and man, where was I? Where was I? I? I don't even know what I was thinking or what I was doing. God's not, God, God's fair. God's more than fair. God's good. He's fair. But watch this. Don't ever say God's not gracious. Because he sent his only begotten son to die for us. So why would we ever say that God's not good or God's not fair, God's not gracious? You see, the problem really wasn't with the landowner. The problem was they had eyes that looked over to somebody else. They had eyes that went and looked at somebody else's life. And I want to say this before we end today. Don't ever wish that you had somebody else's life because you never know what they've gone through you never know the mental torment that they have where they are right now you never know the shoes they walk in and, and this is what Jesus is trying to say to the disciples don't be concerned about heaven don't be concerned about who's greatest in heaven you just be thankful for what you have. You be grateful for what you have. You give glory for what you have. Because there's some other people that's walked away. Remember the rich young ruler? Remember Nicodemus? Remember some of these people? They walked away. They didn't receive the eternal life. And, and Jesus is giving this story to try to really let the disciples understand. You think it did any good? You know what happens in chapter 20 towards the end? James and John... They go make a deal with their mother and they send their mother to Jesus and they say, hey Jesus, this is their mother speaking, when my boys get to heaven, will you sit one of them on your left and the other one on your right? Please? And Jesus was like, are you kidding me? Did, did we not just have a conversation about this? Right? How, how many of you stubborn like me? Anybody? A couple of you? See, when we're stubborn, it takes a brick to get our attention. It, it really takes something hard to slap us across the head to really get our attention. And sometimes God gets my attention, and it hurts. But I don't want that to happen to you. I want you to listen to this parable and understand it, okay? So, a couple of things right here. You see, these, the 6 o'clock crowd, they were happy at 6 o'clock, weren't they? Oh, yeah. Because they knew at the end of the day, they're taking home 
Or, you know what, let's just be, maybe we need to change our, they're taking home $1,000. Okay, can we just change it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, we're going to work for 12 hours, we're going to take a large sum of money home. I don't have to work for the rest of the week type of money, right? And so here, they're, they're joyful. Man, they're, they're singing praises. They're out there picking the, the grapes off the vine, singing, praising. But what happens at 6 o'clock? What happened to their joy? It went away, didn't it? You know why their joy went away? Because they were more interested about what was happening to the other people than what had already happened to them. And that joy was gone. And what happens when you lose your joy? You start complaining. So you know how to keep from complaining? Be grateful. You be grateful. You get a glass of water from the water, Spick it. I bet none of you have done this in the last couple of days. You run that water and it fills up the cup. Say thank you before you take that first sip. Man, thank you that we have running water in the house. Anybody grew up with no running water in the house? Wow. Some of you can appreciate that a little bit more then, right? But for some of us, we've always had running water, always had phones, always had gasoline, always had what we needed, always had it, right? Are we really grateful? So we need to be grateful. When that gratefulness runs out, the joy's gone. And when that joy runs out, we start complaining. I want some of his joy, right? That's what we do. Give me some of that joy from Tim. I want some of his joy. He's happy all the time. Give me some of that. Give me some of that. But you know what happens? We can be restored to that joy. We can have that joy restored right here today. And we can be grateful, all right? Number two, be joyful. Man, if you just wake up every day and say, man, at least I'm not six feet underground. Man, that's something to be joyful about, right? Man, at least God's given me another opportunity today. Be joyful. Look for the joy in everything. Man, if you get to go to work every day, be like, man, thank you, Lord, for giving me this job. Thank you. I know there's a lot of heartache, but we're going to overlook that. We're going to just praise your name because I've got an income coming in. Are you joyful today? Because if you're not joyful, you're grumbling. All right, spouses, y'all be honest with me. How many of you have got a spouse that's been a little grumbling? Anybody? Oh, I see. see if he's looking. Be careful. Be joyful. Be graceful. Wasn't that the landowner? Wasn't the landowner so gracious? Hey, we, man, we made a great deal. Man, I'm, I'm willing to pay you $300 to go work for 12 hours. And, man, they took it. They were like, man, this is a great deal. He was so gracious. His grace was so good. His greatness was so good. His goodness was so good. Is that it? His goodness was so good that he wanted to keep going back to the marketplace and say, is there anybody else here that I can bless? Is there anybody else here that wants to work? Man, I just want to bless you. Hey, come work for me. Just come on. I, he was looking for people to bless. Just looking for, that's who God is. He's looking for people who he can bless. Because that's who he is. He wants what is good. He wants to do what is good. He wants to bless your socks off. So we ought to be graceful ourselves. We ought to extend a little grace to other people. We ought to be graceful because, you know, in all honesty, we are that 5 o'clock crowd. Nobody else wanted to hire us throughout the day because they said you're no good. You're not as strong as the other guys. You're not as good looking. You don't smell as good, right? I mean, you got to think, anybody ever been on that eighth grade volleyball team or dodge, dodgeball? Everybody lines up. You got two team captains and you start choosing. Man, I was, I was team captain one day. Man, I was looking. I want you. You're fast. Oh, I want you. You're strong. Right? And what's it come down to? The little puny kid. Right? Don't ever get picked. It always gets picked last. Remember, that's David out in the field. That's who God picks. That's who God uses the most. You know why those little ones are so good at dodgeball? Because by the time that they throw that ball, man, it's already at the ground. They're good. Man, they can just whoop, whoop, right, real quick. Big guys take up big spaces, you know, and it, they're not good at dodgeball. Anybody play dodgeball in school? That's like the official school sport. 
All right, we're going we're gonna to close this up because I'm, I'm starting to ramble now. But man, isn't God good? God is so good. And, and, and I look around and, and I see, I, I'm so grateful for you. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. It is an honor to stand here as your pastor, as a preacher, to be able to get you excited about the things of God, to get you excited about His Word, to motivate you, to get out into the world and put a smile on your face. More than anything, I want you to walk away today considering how blessed you are. Don't look at nobody else. Don't consider what anybody else has or what they're doing or what anything. Just consider yourself. Because you could be out on a street corner right now or living under a bridge or in a domestic violence or in a home where it's not even safe to come out of your bedroom or in a drug rehab somewhere see I got a family member right now that's in Atlanta, Georgia addicted to drugs Me and my wife prayed about it. And he said, if we can get him here and get him away from those druggies, we could give him a better life. Hopefully, something. But obviously God says, no, he needs more than that. And so they shipped him to a rehab, into a, a drug facility. And I'm going to tell you something, that fentanyl will absolutely kill you. And that's coming across the border faster right now than anybody can imagine. And if y'all love any of these young folks back here, you will do whatever you have to do to keep them from ever touching it, from ever even looking at it. Because the first time they take a dose of it, they're addicted. And then they turn into thieves, stealing. And then to the point to where they don't even know what they're doing. And that's where we as a church have to do whatever we have to do to help somebody, to be graceful, to be considerate, because we don't know what somebody's walking through today. I don't even know what you're walking through today. I know I'm sitting up here talking about how good God is, how great He is, because, man, I, I tell you, there's a lot of bad things that's happened to me in my life, but I'm standing here right now saying, man, I am so blessed. I am so blessed. But you may not be here saying that. And that's where I want you to turn away your thinking, your perspective. Because you are sitting right here. God has given you an opportunity. God has blessed you. God has given you more than you desire. Or more than you deserve. God wants to give you what you want. But He's going to give you what you need more than anything. Because God is good. And I'm telling you, there are some people struggling in this world today. There are some people right now, they would say, I would rather die than face another day. And that makes me look at my life and say, Whoo, man, I get to stand before a congregation and talk about Jesus. How good is that? I mean, I, I get to stand and proclaim the goodness of God. Wow. I consider myself blessed more than any of you. I mean, if the rapture were to happen right now, me and Craig are the only ones that have competition. I'm about three inches taller than you, so I'll be the first to go. I'll be screaming down there at y'all, hey, you know, this is good, this is good. This is great. I'm not a prophet. This ain't prophecy, but I am telling you this. 2023 is going to be the best year in this church. You know why? You know why? Because God is good. 2023 is going to be the best year in this church because you're here. Because God has placed you right here, right now, to be part of this. And we couldn't do it without you. See, I, I wanted to preach this last week. And all honestly, I had this sermon ready to go 
back at the end of October. I wanted to preach about the sovereignty of God. When we started the follow me messages, that was the first sermon. I was like, man, I can't wait to preach. And God says, nope, not yet. And then a couple of weeks ago when he was like, okay, now you go preach it. Now I kind of understand why now. Because God is good. And we need this. We, we, we need this motivation right now. Okay? So don't be grumbling. Don't be complaining. Be joyful. Be grateful. Amen? We got a lot to be thankful for. God is good. God is so good. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I know that there are some people that are either watching online, they're hearing, watching, or maybe they're sitting right here in these pews. And deep down in their hearts, they're saying, God, it's not right, it's not fair. But Lord, I hope and I pray that we change our perspective and we really see how good you are. We really see the benefits of heaven. We see the benefits of salvation. So Lord, I pray if there's someone sitting here listening that has never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray that today they say, I need it. I want it. And I take it. So Father, help us. In these next few minutes, Lord, I pray that that person that needs to step out of the aisle will have the boldness courage to step out and say I need to make a decision and Lord we pray that us as a church we will surround each other with love with compassion and grace not knowing what anybody's going through but knowing we're here as a family we're going to stick together we're going to love on each other because there's some good things about to happen we don't need any distractions happening this next year. So, Lord, I pray that your blessings be upon us. Lord, that we look back even 20 years from now and be like, y'all remember 2023? Wow. Lord, I know what you can do. I see what you can do. And I know it's about to happen. So, Father, help us get ready. Lord, we thank you for this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.